that's how we get along the uh, on the stream instead. Mm. I'm going to sit behind Simon Bowman for poking. So for tonight we have uh, two really good interesting talks, more on the technical side, uh, and we're going to have, actually before we talk about the talks, let me talk about who we are at uh, London News Group. So this is the, the group that organizes these events. We have Paul Chapman, he's busy working, Simon is here, but he may the both stay, stay and do the work, and Laura can't be here unfortunately tonight. Uh, then we have Paolo, he's the one running uh, all the the, the video and the sound and everything else. We have Sarah, she's sitting down the other end, and then myself. Uh, we've been doing this for about three, four years now, uh, and we really enjoyed having you here, so thank you for taking the time. The next thing is today's speakers. So we'll have uh, Toen. Uh, Toen is the table practice lead at Curious, uh, com table partner and consultancy firm. He is the author of Tuple Magic. He was telling me uh, earlier that Tuple Magic is one year uh, that he created the blog. And you'll see everything about Tuple Magic tonight and he will be able to tell you all about the visualizations that he creates. Uh, he's also a sort of dancing instructor. The, no. <laughs> this is the fourth beer. <laughs> so get, give me another two and then my teacher. Um, and you can find him on Twitter as well. And we have Oh, <laughs> what happened? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Archana, I'm not going to try and pronounce your name. Uh, she's a senior product consultant. She's been with Pablo uh, for about three years now. Uh, she's a seasoned speaker. She's been, she's been uh, in New Orleans. For those of you that are going to attend the conference uh, in Berlin, you can also see her there. And she also co-leads the Data Plus Women uh, event. If you haven't been, it's a great opportunity to meet up uh, as well. And you can find her on Twitter. Uh, she's been there uh, about three weeks now. <laughs> <laughs> Only because I asked her because I needed to put it for this. So. Uh, and I guess with that, I will uh, hand it over to Rajana. She'll be doing our first call. Uh, oh, one thing that I didn't say. We expect you to ask questions. There are t-shirts for anyone that asks okay. questions at the end. Good <laughs> <laughs> <Is it> bright. <laughs> yeah. I think one thing you use your laptop just works when you plug it in. Welcome to Scaffolding, the solution to tough time-based problems. My name is Archana Ganeshalingam, that's how you say my surname, just say it faster with confidence than you're usually fine. And I'm a senior product consultant um, and I've been at Tableau for three years, aligned primarily with the UK and Ireland team. And last year I had the pleasure of delivering this session at our conference in New Orleans. And I'm excited to give you all a sneak preview here today, but I'm also going to be presenting the whole thing live in Berlin in a few short weeks as well. Um, unfortunately, this time around, I'm not presenting with my usual partner in crime, Sasha. She's another product consultant based over in Austin. And you'll come to find out why we're wearing these silly hats as part of this session in just a second. I forgot to bring mine with me, it's sitting at home. <laughs> um, so kind of like a rough, rough agenda. So during this session, um, you're going to become familiar with a mantra. Um, data stored efficiently is not always stored effectively. And I'm going to come on to what that means in just a second. 
and I'm going to be covering how to recognize situations where you might need to use scaffold tables to pad the data. So creating additional data so that you can create the visualization you need. And where you work, this could be as simple as an Excel file, which I'll be using in one example, but also what we call a date DIN table, or just like a list of dates that usually exists within most databases. And of course, I'm going to be showing you all of this in Tableau Prep. Um, but these examples can be done in desktop. So if you don't have prep yet, you should, first of all, you should get it. I, I, I love it, love it probably more than desktop, but probably not the right audience to say that in front of when all of you are amazing visitors. Um, yeah, you can, you can do all these in desktop. The reason why I like doing them in prep is because when you are um, padding and duplicating your data, prep gives you that visual interface to actually see what's going on so you can understand what's going on behind the scenes um, when duplicating the data. And I want to just quickly caveat this session as well, because it has been rated a Jedi session at conference. And when David and Caroline asked me to present it here today, I was a bit reluctant because I didn't know what the mix of the user group tends to be, because it can be, you know, people who found out about Tableau last week versus people who've been using Tableau longer than I have. So what I did was I kind of tried to take the key points um, because I think none of the features that I show are Jedi, it's more putting that Jedi thinking hat on and thinking more problem solving rather than you know any crazy advanced features. The hardest thing I show is a join. I'm hoping all of you know what a join is. Um, if not, you're gonna learn today anyway. Um, so these are where the hats come in. So we're gonna be doing this by pre presenting each example from the perspectives of two different characters. And because Sasha was a true Texan from Austin, she was our All-American cowgirl, while I, as the Brit, was the British policeman, or as we like to say over here, Bobby. And the database Bobby is the data engineer or database administrator. So they know exactly what's stored in the database, um, specifically how it's been stored, so you, it's been optimized for efficiency in terms of both space, so amount of storage, as well as query times. And then we've got our cowgirl, the data wrangler. She's an advanced analyst with one thing on her mind, trying to answer the trickiest of the business's questions. Um, so think kind of your advanced Tableau Jedi, someone who's been using Tableau for a while, knows what they need to do um, when it comes to the data. And often these two users can butt heads because the data wrangler needs the data in a very specific format to answer the question she needs. But the database probably might be reluctant to allow access to do that because it might require storing a huge amount of data in the database. It might require giving her access to credentials that they might not be willing to share. And so what I hope the key takeaway from this session is, is that prep can be the bridge between those two, um, two characters. So the agenda. So like I said, I'm only give, presenting half of this session today. So I've just picked the first two examples but if you're not coming to berlin don't worry you're not missing out because this session is already up on youtube from the recording from last year and i'm also going to be sharing all the resources for the entire session with the tag leaders so they can pass it on to you afterwards as well so on to our first example i was exploring some data about which songs kind of make the spotify top 200 charts worldwide and i noticed something interesting one of the biggest hits from the last couple of years it's 24 Karat Magic by Bruno Mars. It was certified platinum in nine countries and even won a Grammy last year. For those of you that don't remember the song or don't know it, here's a quick clip. Um, I can find it. I have now lost it. Great. Does anyone want to sing it? <laughs> um, here we are. The video's coming up. This song became one of my Spotify, you know, the top 100 at the end of the year. This popped into it because every time I was rehearsing, I would play the song. It's like it's skewing all my numbers. <laughs> um, so this is a line graph showing us 24K's magic position in the charts in 2017. And for those of you that don't know, that song was actually released at the end of 2016, but it continued to rain, remain popular throughout the entirety of the following year. But you can see, as kind of expected, its popularity wanes um, and starts, starts to disappear. Um, but there's something odd here. It seems like the song flatlined towards the end of the year, just stuck at that same position. But that can't be right. That doesn't really make sense. Um, because, you know, there's always new songs coming in. It's, it's really unusual for a song to flatline like that. Um, and, it's, and it's not. And um, what Tableau is doing is it's filling in the gaps for the days where we don't have any data. Um, 
It's just simply joining up the dots. And so this doesn't help us identify when the song might have dropped in and then back um, in and out of the charts. So what we're aiming for is something like this, where we can now spot where there are some, some trends in the data. So we can see it actually dropped for quite a while, came back for just a day, then dropped out, maybe kind of part of the end of year playlist kind of thing. Um, so let's take a look at how the data is actually stored. So this is what the data, the raw data looks like pulled directly from Spotify. And the problem here is that when a song falls out of the charts, it's not stored as a record. So here, for example, from the 29th of October through to the 1st of January, we've got no data. Um, and this is a Jedi session, so some of you guys are Tableau pros. You might be thinking, why can't we use the ZN, um, the zero null function? So what that does is turn any nulls into zeros. That's not going to work here because there's no null to correct. There's literally missing data. And this is one of the key takeaways of the session is the difference between missing data versus null data. Null data means there's still data there, just that little column or row is, is missing some pieces. Um, so we need to create those nulls by panning out the data. And this is what we mean by data that's not stored effectively, because now we have a row for every year, every day in, in the data set. Um, even, if, even if there was no um, no chart, chart position associated with them, so we can see that in the viz with the 141 nulls indicator. And this highlights the underlying theme and mantra for this session. So I'm just gonna say it one more time, but I'm gonna say it a hundred more times, is that data stored efficiently isn't always data stored effectively to answer those complex business questions. So let's see how we can use Tableau Prep and a calendar table to help us out here. How many of you guys are using PrEP right now in your organizations? Cool. Looks like about 50-50 split. Um, so I'll spend a little bit of time talking through the interface as well then for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, so here I've already connected to my data stored in a SQL server and I'm going to pull out the Spotify charts data. So just drag and drop it onto the canvas and let that connect. So it's just going to take a second to load in. And a few things here. So this is our input step. So we can see here the, the field names that we're pulling in as well as some, some sample values. But this isn't the most kind of helpful way to look at the data when you first connect to it. I always add a clean step because what that does is it loads in the profile pane where I can see the underlying distribution of that data. So these are histograms that show me the number of records associated with, with that row. So here I'm going to go in and search for my track. I'll zoom in again. Okay. And just keep only that track. So then we can see that all update. And at the bottom we can see it's just Bruno Mars. Let me know if I'm going too fast or if I'm not zooming in enough because I know prep is really teeny tiny on the screen. Um, so what we want to do here is pad out the data with what we call a date dim or calendar table. Let me go ahead and bring that in as well. So this is about as simple as it gets when it comes to data. It's literally just a row with every single day in 2017 in it. Nothing complicated about it. And what we're going to do is join this data set onto the existing charts data set. So to do that in prep, it would just be drag and drop to the right side of, of the existing step to join those two. And what Tableau Prep does is it automatically spots the date field in common. And then it's the summary of drawing results here that kind of highlights what we're doing when we're padding out the data. So because we're matching date on date, the drawing result is just going to keep all 125 rows together. But what we want to do is keep those missing dates, the ones that we don't have um, the, the song that we're looking at charted for, we want to include those. So the join type here is a right join. So I go in and select that, it's going to update the drawing result. So now when I take a look at my data, I'm going to have two day fields. And the one that we want is the second one because that comes from the calendar table. So it has every single day and we don't have those nulls. Uh, let me remove that one first and then rename that to date. So now that I'm kind of ready to now that I'm ready and I have the right structure for this analysis, I can go ahead and add an output step and then go ahead and look at it in desktop. So let me go ahead and jump into desktop to do that. So here I can go a little bit faster. I can just drag and drop position broken out by date 
at a daily level. And then here, what we want to do is reverse the axis because the number one song is the better place to be. So we want to edit the axes to reverse. And I always think with charts data, I like doing it as a step lines graph. So that's just that option there. Um, yeah, and now that we've padded out the data, we can start to spot things that we didn't previously notice. So one thing here is that for a day, the song dropped out of the charts and we would have missed that because before what Tableau would have done, would have it would have just kind of joined those dots up. So you don't notice those, those patterns and trends. Um, let's go back to the slides to recap. So what did we just do? So when we wanted to see when a song fell out of the Spotify top 200 charts and came back in, we need to join in a calendar table that gives us a row for every day in the time period that we're analyzing. Um, and kind of more broadly speaking, if we just abstract that and take that into the key concepts, it's when a line item drops out of the data set, usually there's no record, so no null. And what padding out the data set does um, with a calendar table is it allows us to create those null values so that we can accurately visualize the time period we're interested in. Um, other kind of weird examples where this might apply is seasonal retail offerings, things like Halloween costumes, Christmas trees, Easter eggs, um, that are only offered during certain times of the year. So with that onto our next example, or last example I should say, because we're only doing a mini version. Um, so I already talked about Spotify, but a lot of things in our lives these days <coughs> go on a subscription basis. Think about Netflix, which I just heard is going up by a pound each month, so look out for that in your next bill. And then Amazon Prime and even Tableau now is on an annual subscription. Um, the, one fo the one thing I'm gonna be focusing on in this example is telecoms contract. So here, each row in the data set just corresponds to a unique contract ID with, what, with information about what product was sold. Um, the, the start date, the month of the start date, how long that contract lasts for, and then the total contract value. So with the data stored like this, you can do simple analysis on it. I'm sure all of you guys can create visits that look like this. So here we've answered things like how many of each product type did we sell? How many contracts did we sign this month? And then, where is it? That one I think is how long is a contract on average? Yeah, looking at the duration and the number of contracts. But to kind of get into that more advanced analytics, and as a business especially, it doesn't actually matter when the contract was signed because all our accounts run on the payment date. So it doesn't matter if we sign you know, 100 accounts, it matters when those payments are due. And that's what this viz is showing. It's showing how much revenue are we guaranteed if we stop selling in, in October 2018 in this example. We'd run out of money by the end of 2020. So we need to get on it and get people signing up to more contracts or renewing their existing contracts with us. So let's again take a look at the data. So with the way the data is currently structured, it's gonna be a challenge to create this viz because we have a row for each contract ID. But what we need is multiple rows for each contract, one for each month that a payment is due. So if we just focus in, I'm, I'm gonna keep coming back to this one as an example. So it's contract ID one, which lasts 11 months. So how I would prefer to store the data would be something like this. Where now for contract ID one, we have 11 rows, one for each month that the contract could last for. And also we're distributing that payment amount, that $330 amount across the 11, 11 months, so $30 um, each. So let's go ahead and look at how we can create this structure, again, using Tableau Prep. And bring out Again, this is stored in my SQL server, so it's the contracts data. And again, I'll add in a clean step. And here, just to prove that there's no funky business going on behind the scenes, if I switch that from a summary view to a detail view, so that's this option here, I can hover and see that I do indeed have one row per contract ID. So this time around, we're not actually gonna be using a date dim table to scaffold this data because unlike the charts data, with contracts, we know that a contract can only last for a defined period. So in this organization, let's say it's two years or 24 months, there's a limit on 
on how far ahead we're going to be looking. And so for that reason, we don't need to use a calendar table and instead we can use what I like to call a scaffold table. So I use those terms to, to mean different things. A calendar to me is just a list of dates, whereas a scaffold is kind of like a tent table. So I'll bring that up so you can see what it actually looks like. Is a, okay, is just a list of how long a contract could potentially last for. So this goes from zero to 23. And we've got a key in here. And what this key allows us to do is it allows us to perform what we call a product join. So joining every row from one data set onto every row of another. So here I just use the key as the number one. But equally, it could be the letter A, it could be Archana, whatever, as long as they match um, on both data sets. So in our original one, I need to go back in and add in that key. So here, again, number one. So now when I take these two data sets and match one on one, every data, every row in the scaffold table will have a match to every row in the contracts table. So we end up with that Cartesian or product join. So we'll drag and drop. And again, it's prep that kind of helps you see that. So when I kind of rehearsed this example before in desktop, it's this bit that obviously doesn't exist or you wouldn't see. Whereas here you can see we're joining 24 rows onto 1,000 rows, so we end up with 24,000 rows. So now when I add in that next clean step and hover over my contract IDs, we can see now we've got 24 rows for every single contract ID rather than just the one. So for my analysis, I don't need my keys. They're just the number one, so I can get rid of them. And I also don't need 24 rows because like we saw in the data, contract ID one only lasted for 11 months. So I'm gonna add in a filter so that the, the number of months from our scaffold table, sorry, I'll zoom in, is less than the duration of the contract. So if I go ahead and save that, we'll let that reset. And now we can see we have the right amount of data. We have 11 rows for contract ID one. So we're cutting out some of the data that we've duplicated and limit, limiting it to just the rows we need. So now we've got two final steps to do. We need to create that payment date field. So here we've got start date. So from here, I'm gonna create a calculated field called payment date. And it's just gonna be date add in months. here where for contract ID 1, the start date remains the same, but the payment date um, goes up by, by a month every month. The next thing I need to do is distribute that contract value across the entire um, contract period. So that's just going to be a pretty simple division of the amount divided by the duration. So I'll write that calculated field again. So this is going to be Again, now we can see that 330 amount has been split across the 11 months into those $30 increments. So let's jump into desktop to see how that allows me to visit. So here I can bring out my total monthly payment rather than amount to get the correct total figure. We're breaking it down not by start date, but by payment date. And then the original viz just broke it down by the different product types as an area chart. So it's as easy as that. So let's pop back to recap this one. So to understand when our customers needed to pay, we needed to create that payment date field that didn't exist in the data set. So we used a scaffold table to pad out the data from the start date through the duration of the contract till the end date or the very last payment. And the, the way I abstract this and apply this to other examples is when one record needs to be represented by many marks, we need to create additional records. 
So joining the data to a scaffold table and all the scaffold table needs to be is, it needs to hold as many records as the maximum numbers a record in your original data set could need to be represented. So in plain English, in our example, the scaffold table was only 24 rows because a contract can only last a maximum of 24 months. Um, so you can use this concept in any kind of subscription-based payment uh, service where payments might occur monthly or annually as well. So I'm gonna wrap up. Um, if you wanna see the other two examples, I'll be demoing them in Berlin, or the examples are already up on YouTube as well. Um, but I wanted to remind everyone of our mantra one last time. It helps to say it out loud together, but I've only presented this to Americans before and they usually like getting involved. So I won't judge if you're quiet and you don't want to say it out loud, but if we could, data stored efficiently is not always stored effectively. Oh, yeah. Can you get a t-shirt? Yeah. Cool, so what's your size? <laughs> well, Dave, that's uh, um, uh, On the second one, I'm, I'm obsessed with efficiency in Tableau Prep. So you're the policeman. Is, uh, is it more efficient to, because when I was looking at it, when I looked at what you did, I was like, I would add the number, the, I would add the duration and then do the join greater than and less than. So I only joined on the records I need to join on rather than do the calculation afterwards and then filter out. Is it more efficient? Just back. Yeah, yeah, sorry. My. In your prep flow. So I, yeah. on that join, I would have created the, uh, the uh, I would have created an end date by adding the duration in months to the, to the start date and then I would have joined on the greater than and less than. So where, so you created, well, you created a week one equals one, I would create a month is where the start date is less than the date and the end date is greater than the date. So, But in this one, the scaffold table is just a list of how long the contract month. could last yeah. for. But yeah, but I, so also I, would, I, would have, I would have had a month's scaffold. So if, I'm just thinking how I would have structured it. As a data, as a data oh. engineer, I would have had a scaffold table which is did which month, is because I always dates. have that. Yeah. Yeah, so then, um, and this is what the third example gets onto. Right, okay. So I get to cover it, but I can talk to you offline about it as well. But there we still use the key to key join, which does, you'll, you'll see in the example, it takes like a 50,000 50, row data set to something like 5 million rows. Yeah. And then we apply the filter still after the fact, right, okay. even, even then. I, I wouldn't swap the order around just okay. because the key to key join is for me, more easy to comprehend. Okay. And, uh, if you're using this method, would that means that you don't have to think about maintenance? Because if you're using a, a, a date, you need to keep incrementing the yeah. date range that you're working, whereas this, you don't have to worry about yeah, no, that. I'm, I'm just thinking because you know, when, when I built a data warehouse, I have a table with dim dates. Dim date I have, already right. exists. I have yeah. dim date that I have every month from the 1st of January 1900 to the 31st of December 2099. Yeah. I wouldn't have a table that just has one to... Yeah. No, I agree, and that's why this one is in an Excel. Oh, the scaffold is in an Excel. This in addition to yeah, to just using a dim table, which I which I just is your have concern then the performance yeah. implication of two connections over? It's just, it's just I'm having to create something extra. I'm just saying, mm. would, it, would 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 I be would I be causing myself a performance issue by using the dim date table and doing a, a join on date? I think you would just because you would be connecting to many many more rows when you do this Cartesian join. But then could you not do the there greater be than? It would then. Because I would create the start and end date and my date table would only be joining on the greater than and less than. So my dim date table would only be joining on the, the dates like Oh, doing, doing an unequal join. Yeah. Sorry, I'm yeah, yeah, just yeah. not keeping up. Okay. Yeah. I see. But then offline, it's fine. I, yeah. Let's, let's talk about offline. Yes. Yeah. You know, my data engineer has to sell the table. Yeah, no, that makes sense. But then could you not do that, sorry, that greater than smaller than join on the duration as well what keeps you from yeah, doing that yeah absolutely yeah like that is the even mm. faster thing because yeah. then you load in what you it's load in yeah. but you do what you do and it's integer oh, yeah it's okay. guess. <laughs> you're guessing what's i'm going to rewrite my session for berlin <laughs> 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 yeah go ahead 
So there's loads of stuff that we do in Tableau Public around kind of scaffolding the data for things such as curved lines and stuff like that. Mm. Have you seen any kind of standard Tableau tech examples of, because a lot of people still do that in Excel? Yeah, I've not, to be honest, not, because when I work with, with perhaps the scaffolding specifically, I've only ever seen it for time-based analysis. So um, Tony and I were talking earlier, and he mentioned the example of hex mapping as yeah. well as one where scaffolding comes up a lot, and I've not seen prep used for that yet at all, if I'm being really honest. It's almost like the block model. Yeah, yeah. it would be really cool. Kind of, if you've got Tableau Public to download this Yeah, stuff, I think for, for the way my brain works, time conceptually makes sense because it's sequential and you, you, you create these product drawings, but then you cut down the data afterwards. But I'm sure there is a way to do hex. Like hex mapping is one of the examples. Any other questions? Can Tableau Prep generate rows as well? So I guess it's assuming it can't because you're doing it with yeah. Design. Yeah, so because Tableau Prep and just Tableau in general doesn't create data, that's why this scaffold table, for example, comes from just an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> guessing sizes. I am guessing sizes. Because <laughs> I don't want to get to the point of, oh, I only have two sizes, so I'm just guessing sizes. Hopefully it's close enough. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for everyone. So, um, so next speaker, uh, just check out where we have pizzas. Pizzas? Actually, let's go and pizza I think it's a pizza outside. Pizzas. <laughs>